This is Michael from Blue Sky Bio. I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're going to let people finish logging into the webinar presentation. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Once again, this is Michael from Blue Sky Bio, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us for the webinar presentation. Please make sure to complete the webinar attendance form so we can send you the CE credit. The webinar attendance form, the link for the form can be found under the viewing windows and was also sent out via email earlier today. We've been Busy with development and releasing new updates and versions of Blue Sky Plan. Our most recent build includes functionality such as an automatic intelligent panoramic curve and automatic nerve detection. So we encourage you to go to our website, blueskybio.com, download the latest version. If you already have the software installed, then you'll be prompted to upgrade via the link within the software. Today's presentation is the third part of a fourth of a four-part webinar series being given by Road Dental Lab and in particular by the head of the guided surgical department, Joe Ambrose. Both Joe and Roe have many years of guided surgical experience and have handled countless number of guided surgical cases and are highly recommended to be contacted for your guided surgical cases as well. Tonight's topic is planning for the future, turning removable cases into fixed cases. Joe, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Michael, and welcome everybody <clears throat> to the uh, third uh, seminar in the series of four. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about and show uh, how to turn locator cases or any kind of uh, freestanding uh, uh, attachment case into a fixed hybrid case uh, or even crown and bridge, fixed crown and bridge. Uh, there are some principles and things that need to be thought of before uh, you even make a guide or do the surgery on a locator or a movable overdenture case. And as you see uh, uh, highlighted in red, uh, every battle is won before it is ever fought, and some of you may have heard of Sun Tzu. Uh, this was written, I don't know, 3,000 years ago, maybe by a Chinese general, and it applies to what we're going to look at and, and, and discuss tonight, because uh, quite often uh, you'll, you may get uh, patients in your practice where you make a locator case for them, and they're happy with it, uh, so much so that they would like to transition from a uh, locator case that they can take in and out to something that they don't have to remove anymore. So uh, that's what this is going to be. So the topics are turning removable cases into fixed hybrid cases. Also, uh, well, I'm going to touch on planning for the immediate, immediate placement implant. And something that I think everybody who places implants needs to think about if you haven't already done it is uh, the fully guided drill kits versus standard drill kits. And in uh, Blue Sky's uh, case, it would be the BioCut Burrs Blucids versus standard drill kits. It really matters uh, in how you uh, approach your surgeries and how you perform your surgeries uh, and uh, the efficiency with which uh, they get done. So there are factors that uh, have to be considered uh, on all of these cases. Uh, one is uh, space for a hybrid or overdenture bar case. Uh, possible bone reduction that is associated with that. 
the implant length for a locator case versus a hybrid or overdenture bar, angulation for locators versus hybrid or overdenture case, uh, the need for additional implants and possible sinus lift for transition from locator case to hybrid or overdenture bar, and also how can occlusion be affected based on implant position. All of those things come into play when we plan a case such as this, uh, and I'm going to address each one of them uh, as, they, as they come along. So the first set of factors that I'll talk about is space requirements for the locator case or versus a fixed hybrid case, possible bone reduction, and implant length. So when we begin the process of planning a, a locator case, uh, most particularly uh, uh, implant placement for a locator case, the vast majority of times the implant is located at the crest of the ridge and that's fine and and typically that gives us enough room for a freestanding locator uh, case to be made. Uh, we need approximately seven millimeters from the crest of the gingiva to uh, opposing occlusion let's say to put a freestanding locator in place. Uh, however if for some reason the patient wants to trans, uh, transition from a removable locator to a fixed hybrid, uh, you may find yourself in a bind if the case is surgerized by placing the implants at the crest. And I have been associated with cases where the doctors have asked me, well, the patient uh, wants a locator case now, but maybe down the road they might think about a hybrid, uh, and can we do that? And my first question to them is, uh, did you prepare them for the fact that there might have to be bone reduction made? Uh, do you know that we won't be able to place the implants for the most part at the crest of the ridge? Because we have to plan for the future for the possibility that uh, this patient may opt for something fixed, uh, like a fixed hybrid uh, case that, that needs more space to restore. So the picture that I have here uh, shows that dynamic and uh, what you see is a, an implant in the number 10 position and the space that we need to restore a hybrid is 15 to 17 millimeters from the top of the implant that you see to an incisal edge or a central fossa. 15 being the minimum amount of space that we can use 17 being the ideal amount of space that we can use, that we need to have. So in the software, uh, we measure down 17 millimeters, and this becomes the position of the uh, platform of the implant. And this is where the top of the implant should end up uh, when we make a hybrid. So in planning the locator case, uh, for a future hybrid possibly, we have to do the same thing. We have to place the implant in this position, level the bone down, and, and do the locator case in that manner. Uh, and frankly, in most cases, it, it helps make a, lo a better locator case because the denture material that is made over the uh, locator is going to be thicker, prosthesis is going to be stronger, and I don't know how many have had this uh, uh, occur, is that uh, sometimes uh, there's not a lot of space between the, uh, the two surface or the pink acrylic surface, tongue side, and, and a locator attachment just continually breaks the acrylic in that position. Well, that's just an indication that there was not enough space to restore it. So whether or not the patient opts for a fixed case down the line, uh, that extra thickness uh, of acrylic over the uh, locator really helps uh, the prosthesis for the long term. So uh, bone reduction level is at the 15 to 17 millimeter mark from an incisal edge and what this determines once we get to this point, once we know where 15 to 17 millimeters is, we know how much bone there is left uh, in the patient's mouth to place an implant. So 
bone reduction, space requirements dictate implant length that we can use on any given case uh, when, when the possibility of a hybrid is, is, exists. So in this particular case, uh, we measured, made our measurement at 17 millimeters and we were able uh, to use uh, 11 and a half millimeter implant in this position uh, for uh, the locators at this point. An 11 and a half millimeter implant on any hybrid case is certainly acceptable uh, as, as, a, as a, uh, an implant length. So this is the main factor that has to be taken into consideration when uh, we are, we're planning one of these cases with the possible change in mind. So other factors uh, to consider are uh, angulation for locators versus the hybrid uh, fixed hybrid case. So you typically on um, freestanding locator cases, we try to plan these implants so that they are perfectly parallel with one another as they go around the arch. And in this case, this is a six implant case. And all of these uh, implants were, were paralleled and are perfectly parallel with one another in the same path of insertion. And, uh, and in all locator cases should be planned accordingly, as close as possible to perfectly parallel. Uh, the software, the Blue Sky software has a tool that allows us to parallel these implants to one another. And it's very simple to use. And, uh, and we go around the arch and choose the implant, align it with the, the, the one that we want to uh, use as our master position. And these implants, one by one, become perfectly aligned. And what that does is, uh, through the lifetime of the, the overdenture, uh, it, it reduces a great deal of, of uh, maintenance to post-insertion maintenance to the case because uh, parallel locator attachments don't wear as quickly as divergently placed locator attachments. Parallel uh, locator uh, uh, implant placements don't uh, cause people to have a path of insertion issues when they uh, seat the case in their mouth as opposed to divergently placed. Uh, you know, the, the company that makes locators uh, and this is just my opinion, uh, because locators are a very good attachment. Uh, they they will tell you that uh, uh, 40 40 degree non-parallel uh, uh, implants uh, can be can be dealt with, can be restored, and they they can. Uh, you can put these uh, t uh, locators in place on divergently placed implants and have the dentures snap into place. But at the same time, uh, they have even uh, stated themselves that the actual metal on the locator attachment can begin to wear or the need to replace the plastic inserts in the locators, it becomes more frequent. So uh, the more divergent, the more possibility there is for uh, post-insertion uh, maintenance. <clears throat> now the hybrid case, on the other hand, uh, it's very rare that we uh, get uh, parallel implants, especially if you're using the all-on-four technique that Nobel uh, espouses. Uh, the posterior implants are at a 30 degree angulation. The anterior implants follow the bone for, mo in, for the most part. Uh, you can possibly align these things parallel uh, if the bone allows, but the, the majority of the time uh, uh, the, there are uh, divergently placed implants with the hybrid uh, uh, dentures. So uh, once uh, a patient commits to a locator case, uh, we make the locator case with this kind of parallel placement. But what that does and what I'm going to show you is that there's uh, the possibility of having to, if they want to transition to a fixed case, there's the possibility of having to uh, place extra implants in the posterior, in the sinus area, if there isn't enough bone that exists, just so that the AP spread can be increased 
to allow uh, us to achieve better occlusion and, and have more teeth to the posterior. And how can occlusion be affected based on implant position? So here is uh, a locator case planned. This is the uh, panoramic view. And in the panoramic view, implants that are parallel don't look parallel. I'm just showing you this to show you where these implants were placed. These, in fact, are perfectly parallel with one another, as you'll see in, the, in one of the next pictures. But the AP spread doesn't go beyond the canines. So that means that if this patient wanted to transition to uh, a, a fixed hybrid case or a crown and bridge case, we would have to, in order to get posterior occlusion, put a couple more implants in the sinus area. And what you see on this slide is that these are short implants. I think they're eight, eight and a half millimeter long implants. And there you may need a sinus lift on, on the right side here. On the left side, I don't think you need to. But if you wanted longer implants than those, you would have to do a, a sinus lift or a sinus bump to be able to place implants back in those positions so that we can get uh, posterior occlusion. And this slide shows it. This is the locator design, and you can see that the AP spread goes from uh, the right canine to the left lateral, and that's simply because the sinuses wouldn't let us do it any differently. Uh, we don't have uh, a lot of, th of thickness here of bone, and we wanted longer implants uh, in order to help support the case better. Uh, so this is as far towards the sinuses, we could get those uh, implants on both right and left side. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, therefore, this was our AP spread. For a locator case, that works fine. Uh, you may or may not be able to take the palate out of that one, depending upon, you know, the patient and how far back the posterior teeth go. But uh, we can make a successful locator case with this design. However, uh, this is not a good enough AP spread if we were to opt to go to uh, a fixed case, uh, whether it be crown and bridge or uh, a fixed hybrid that is non-removable by the patient, we could go back to uh, maybe on the right side, maybe the second bicuspid, and on the left side, the first bicuspid. And that's all the occlusion that that particular prosthesis would uh, be able to, to uh, uh, stand. So. You know, we have, the ha we, we have the need for extra implants in a situation like this. Now, you may find cases that uh, over the sinus we have uh, thick enough bone uh, for uh, implants, but at the same time we have to create the, the space, the 15 to 17 millimeters that I mentioned earlier uh, from the, the platform of the implant to an occlusal surface or an incisal edge of a tooth. So that is the kind of planning that um, is required and the thought required to uh, approach one of these cases. Um, uh, before you tell your patient it's possible to do it, uh, you, you, you know, they have to know what uh, is uh, involved uh, if they decide to follow through and transition. Is there any questions yet, Michael, that I can answer? Uh, no, not yet. If anybody has questions, you can enter them into the chat box on the right side of the screen, mm -hmm. and we'll address them during the presentation. Okay. Now, one, one thing I do when I plan these cases is uh, for uh, hybrids, and, uh, and for a case like this that might be transitioned, is the abutments, the yellow posts that I have on these, they're kind of custom, uh, and I do this for planning purposes. I make them. Uh, 17 millimeters long to begin with so that when I put the implant in there I know exactly where it has to go and and therefore I'm able to determine uh, the length of the implant accordingly so it's a it's a big help to use this as a guide for uh, you know to measure from the incisal edge uh, down 17 millimeters uh, and, and show you where the implant has to start so that's just something that I've kind of developed as I worked with these kinds of cases Okay. All right. Now, uh, well, that's that's the last side, last slide on transitioning, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's a lot of thought, but uh, we do more and more of this type of thing uh, as far as uh, removable cases transitioning into 
uh, fixed hybrids or crown and bridge. Now, if, uh, for instance, uh, the patient wanted to go from a, a locator case to uh, standard crown and bridge with uh, uh, custom abutments and that sort of thing, what we would have to do when we planned this locator case was to put the implants in tooth positions. And that becomes uh, difficult on some cases depending upon bone and AP spread uh, for us to do that. In this case, we know that the patient may go to a fixed hybrid, and which means that uh, embrasures are not an issue uh, versus crown and bridge where embrasures would be an issue. So if this patient wanted to go to a uh, fixed crown and bridge instead of a, a screw down hybrid denture type case, we would have to put these implants in the normal tooth position so that when we would uh, make a screw retained appliance or cement retained appliance, we would not have implants in the embrasures. But the same rules would apply as far as uh, how much bone, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, implant, how many implants you need and the possibility for uh, more implants uh, to create an AP spread. Now the one thing that you don't have to plan for if the patient wants to go to fix crown and bridge type restoration is bone reduction isn't necessary in, in usually in, in that instance because we can keep the implants you know at the crest uh, because we're going to make a, a, a custom abutment and the, the amount of space needed for uh, crown and bridge type restoration isn't the same that you need for a fixed hybrid. So if there's no questions about that, and if you have any, as I'm talking about the, the rest of the program here and you, and you have questions, feel free to, uh, to ask and uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to entertain those. So what we'll talk about now is uh, planning for the immediate implant placement. And this is a pretty tricky uh, topic depending upon the drilling system that you have uh, because there's many uh, possibilities here that, uh, that we have. In this particular uh, case, uh, this tooth is going to be removed. It's one of the centrals and an implant is going to be placed in its, in, its, in its spot. So we try to keep the implant in a crestal position, which this is and we try to get the implant in a position where we will gain some primary stability, which this case provides. However, uh, if you use a surgical guide for this, uh, we have to respect the soft tissue when we have our guide. And let me find this case. I think it's right. No, that's not it. Mm. This is it right here. We have to respect the soft tissue on on this particular kind of a case. And if you look at this picture, I have virtually removed the clinical crown of this tooth. And uh, this sleeve is placed as far uh, towards the bone as it possibly can go uh, before, you know, the sleeve would prevent the seating of the guide on the teeth. So we can only take the sleeve down so far before the sleeve prevents the guide from seating. But what you see now is this is where we get our primary stability. This is the root as you can tell. Uh, you can see the implant beyond the root and that is our primary stability area. But at the same time we have to have a drill that can drill from uh, the top of the sleeve to the apex of the implant and reach that depth. Now, there are uh, a lot of drilling systems out there, but most of the standard drill kits that that are used don't have drills typically beyond 17 or 19 millimeters. Some do, some don't. Uh, you know your system uh, very well, so you'll know what, what you're drilling with, but uh, for the most part, uh, I'm going to use 17 as my guide. Uh, this, the 17 millimeters that you see right here is measured from the top of the sleeve and this is as far down as that burr is going to reach. So 
what you're going to, and here's the implant, so this drill is only going to go a very short way into this bone, meaning that you will have to then take the guide off and finish the osteotomy freehand to reach the final depth uh, of, of the osteotomy. Now, there are some cases where uh, the actual root is uh, long enough that if you use standard burrs, you won't hit any bone. Your burr will be sitting in a socket, and and which is at that point in time is going to render your guide useless. So, uh, what we need on this particular case is a drill that is 22 millimeters long at least, and that's where we get into uh, the the uh, biocut burrs, or we get into fully guided uh, uh, kits that have long burrs to satisfy that. And uh, so that, let me go back to this case. Uh, so what I'm going to show you here, now there's a couple ways to, to solve this uh, and one way to help it. And of course it's going to cause, uh, if you want more primary stability, then basically what we need to do here is to choose uh, an implant that is longer. So let's go to a 15 millimeter implant. So this puts the implant more in bone. You'll get better primary stability with the case. But at the same time, our drilling depth now becomes 23 millimeters at least. So my suggestion is you need to have drills in your drill kit that at minimum have a 25 millimeter drill length to help satisfy some of these depths that uh, we have when we do any kind of implants and especially immediate placement implants so that we get beyond the socket and down into bone. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. Now, for those of you who, uh, I don't know what the experience level is with uh, the audience here, but uh, one thing that uh, has to be taken into consideration and one thing that causes drill length to be long is something called prolongation and that's the space between the top of the implant and the top of the sleeve so in the, so the prolongation uh, that space that I just described in this case is nine millimeters that you see over here on the right and the implant length is 15 so the drill length on this case is 24 millimeters and that's that's how you determine in, in in blue sky software at least those are the two calculations that you make to determine drill length now the sleeve that you see here can be manipulated depending upon where the soft tissue is or where the bone is we can make the sleeve drilling depth shorter uh, you know if you want to flap a case and you want your drill depth to be shorter you can do that uh, in which case this drilling depth would then go down to 20 millimeters which is still longer than most uh, standard drill lengths in most drill kits so having a, uh, a guided kit available or biocut burrs that has those lengths makes uh, everything easier and with with guided systems um, what you'll find is that you need one guide versus multiple guides uh, with the biocut burr you need one guide versus multiple guides and so over time that saves you money so it's win-win uh, in all of those things other than the investment you make in buying the burrs but they pay for themselves in savings of, of guides over time okay so uh, any questions about immediate placements Michael uh, no no questions yet okay no questions. all right all right so uh, finally we go into the fully guided drill kit versus the standard drill kit and it matters I think that uh, it matters uh, a lot I think it's one of the key points of guided surgery is to use kits that allow you to use fully guided uh, systems that give you depth control which is allowing you to drill to the full depth of the osteotomy without having to take the guide out and uh, reaching the, the uh, apex of the osteotomy. 
Uh, so the advantages, fully guided kits or biocut burrs, is there are longer drills for deep sites. Only one guide is needed, which saves money over time. And you can drill to the bottom of the osteotomy without having to finish depth cuts freehand without the guide in place. And that's a big, I think that's a big issue uh, that a lot of people actually uh, are surprised about when they first start to get into this kind of surgery. That's something that they don't think about and they're kind of, oh, really, I have to do that. So, and it's possible, it's not hard to do, but it's something that they didn't expect to happen. Uh, simply because of what they had envisioned in their mind as, as guided surgery. Okay. So this is an example of a guided kit. This kit has burrs anywhere from 15 millimeters long all the way up to 28 millimeters long. So I can honestly say that in all the thousands and thousands of cases we've done that we've never had a drilling depth 28 millimeters long. So this particular kit would satisfy any drilling depth that you might have. They come with trefine burrs, they come with uh, tissue punches, they come with the pilot burrs, uh, and, you know, and, and the spoons or the handles that help uh, guide uh, you know, these burrs, you know, into uh, the osteotomies. So you, because you only need one guide, so that means that the sleeves in the guide are master sleeves and the little spoon handles that fit into those are sized for each different uh, drill diameter. And as we see these burrs, we go from 15 to 28, they are all bigger in diameter than the previous one, so that there's a drill sequence. This is a universal kit, which means that you can use it with any implant system, and um, uh, it allows uh, you to drill down to depth and the uh, caveat to it is that uh, in doing so, uh, because it's a universal kit, you the last burr that you use is going to be from the uh, parent kit or the master implant uh, uh, drill kit uh, uh, to uh, drill to the actual length of the implant that's going to be placed so that the final osteotomy size is sized for that implant system. And this is the standard drill kits. And you can see uh, here we go through a, a dr drill sequence all the way up to 5.4 millimeters. And it has all the different uh, uh, bone taps, crestal bone drills, depth gauges, uh, all of those things and all the different sizes. But they're not long. This, these are made for the lengths that the implant company provides. And in a lot of cases won't reach the bottom of the osteotomy. And here you can see uh, this is just one particular implant company's burrs uh, with a standard burr kit. You can drill anywhere from seven and a half millimeters deep all the way up to 15. But any drill depth more than 15, uh, you won't be able to satisfy. You'll have to drill down as far as you can go, take the guide out, and finish off the osteotomy depth. Uh, a lot of people get uh, uh, pilot guides and have one uh, pilot burr that's real, you know, very long to drill the osteotomy to depth, take the guide out, finish off with the, the parent company's implant burrs, which is fine, and that works well. So um, I am a big proponent of biocut burrs or fully guided drill kits. Uh, in surgery for efficiency and accuracy as you know if, if for instance you drill uh, an osteotomy with a uh, two millimeter burr your pilot burr and you can't go down as deep as you want to go you have to take the guide out uh, there is the chance that you can lose a little trajectory uh, freehanding th that case and as you go through your drills uh, you can lose a uh, you know, trajectory I'm not talking a, a great deal but there are cases where uh, you really thread the needle, especially in lower anterior or upper lateral sites where the bone's very narrow and, and uh, you know, a millimeter one way or the other or half a millimeter one way or the other can make a difference. So, uh, you know, that's one thing to consider when you choose uh, drilling kits. Joe, there's a question that came in regarding 
uh, if you have any issues with access due to the length of 20 plus millimeter drills? There is uh, access issues. I know exactly what you're talking about. And once in a while that happens. Uh, what I think you're alluding to is how, how wide the patient can open their mouth in order to get a drill in place. Um, and, you know, I, it may happen more than I know, but I haven't had, uh, uh, you know, I've had very few doctors call me and tell me they couldn't make it work. The patient couldn't open their mouth as wide as they wanted. Some have where they, you know, what they end, what, what ends up having to be done is you have to use a shorter drill so you can start a site and take the, the guide out and finish off freehand to the final depth. But in my experience, that is, you know, that's been rare. Uh, and in most cases, the doctors find a way to get the drill in. Now, and again, the, the 28 millimeter burr is rare. Uh, we're typically, you know, the, the longest burr that we see used the most is the 25. And three millimeters can make a difference. And there's also a way that uh, with these long burrs, uh, we can make uh, side cut openings in them so that you can go in with the tip of your burr through the uh, facial portion of the sleeve and not have to go up and over the sleeve and down into it to, to get your burr to seat. So that would save you, uh, you know, that can save you five, six millimeters right there uh, in, in access. So there's a few ways to get around it, but every once in a while you're going to find an instance where that just doesn't work. So, uh, but again, for the most part, uh, that has not been a major issue. There's a question that came in regarding torque and R torque and RPM settings for the biocut drills, and also if you could elaborate a little bit between the difference between the biocut drills and other standard guided surgical kits. Okay, the biocut burr is a burr. It's a single burr, and uh, it's made to make one osteotomy. In other words, in standard uh, implant drilling, uh, there's a series of burr sizes that you go, you, that you must go through, a drill sequence, a 2 millimeter, a 2.3, uh, you know, a 2.8 and so on. And uh, that's, you know, that takes time. Uh, and you must go through that sequence for the most part in order to get your implant seated without burning bone or causing bone trauma and implant failure. The biocut system, on the other hand, is a burr that is so sharp uh, that you only need that one burr for your osteotomy. Now, it, it comes with uh, drill stops, a drill stop system that um, allows us to make a guide that the, the drill and the stop fits through the, the, the master tube. And basically, this one uh, burr makes the final osteotomy and uh, it, it's very accurate, it's very fast, it's very sharp, it does not cause uh, you know bone burning as long as the RPMs and I don't know what exactly the RPMs are for it but as long as the drilling protocol is followed uh, then uh, you, you know you should have a, a successful osteotomy with one one drilling do you know the RPMs suggested for that, Mike? I don't think they should be used differently than uh, standard drills are. I think the same RPM settings as standard drills should be used for the biocut drills as well. Yeah, and we're we're doing more and more of the biocut, which uh, people find, uh, you know, very useful. Uh, you know, for in, say, for instance, uh, you're in a uh, uh, real thin area, real narrow area where you, you really don't want to do a lot of drilling. Uh, you can use a very narrow biocut burr and go in there and uh, very cleanly do your osteotomy in one one shot, one one drilling sequence, and you're ready to put the implant in. So uh, I think it's very worthwhile. I think it, it's very successful. Uh, the nice thing about it is that, and, uh, and not only the biocut burr, but uh, all implants, all the Blue Sky implants, and all the parts needed for Blue Sky. Uh, first of all, the software will tell us uh, the software will tell us what bio cut uh, setting uh, or what what right here bio cut this uh, direct cut parts. In other words, we're talking about the direct cut burr. 
this is the, the drill stop that's needed. It tells us the drill we need, a metal cylinder we need, and it also tells us the implant. So if, if you use a Blue Sky implants, we can order it. We can send you the guide. We can send you the stop, the drill, the tube that goes in it, and the implant, all, at, all with the guide. And it's very simple and easy. And, uh, and you know, Blue Sky implants are, are very high quality and uh, extreme, well, I, I think the major implant companies now are starting to realize they have to com compete with this, uh, with, with Blue Sky because their prices are so good for a very high quality implant. And, uh, you know, that's a critical thing uh, as time goes by with this, this implant uh, uh, technology. Just to uh, respond to a question that came in, the, the BioCut, the direct cut drills are manufactured by Blue Sky Bio. <laughs> Um, and they're available on our website. They also remove the requirement to use any keys or handles during the surgery, which number one simplifies the surgery, and number two is a significant reduction in price compared to buying a guided surgical kit when you could get just the drill necessary for the case, you know, and over time accumulate the drills and you reuse them as as you have additional cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other questions? Not at this, at this time. Okay. I want to go back to one case here uh, that I talked about. And as I was talking about it, I I realized I wanted to show one other thing, too. And this is the one where we might have, you know, this is the one where we did a locator case, as you can see, in the anterior. And we needed to put implants more posterior to that. So let me show you how the AP spread would turn out when we do that. Uh, I'm going to show these as visible implants now okay and so if we wanted to do crown and bridge or if we wanted to do a hybrid and in this case I would say a hybrid is prudent because the amount of distance between this anterior implant and the posterior implant here is three teeth so you know a hybrid framework is much stronger I think than you know a crown and bridge framework might be especially if it you know, uh, we have a close bite. Um, so now you can see by adding implants for a hybrid, the kind of uh, spread you can get uh, and create better occlusion, meaning uh, how, does how does implant placement affect occlusion? Well, this is how it does. We can go now back to probably second molars if we wanted to on this case, uh, rather than uh, stopping at the premolars to, to restore. So... Uh, now, if we wanted to do uh, sinus lifts on this and wanted longer implants, I would simply choose uh, a longer implant to put in. And now you can see here how much into the sinus we're going to go. Uh, and we have a longer implant in place. I'll put an 11 and a half or an, an 11 and a half in on this side and show you that. So this sinus lift is not. I mean, we're talking about four millimeters, five millimeters of bone. That's not, uh, I mean, that's pretty uh, pretty standard, I would say. That's nothing unusual. And on the, on, the, on, the, on the left side here, we're talking about maybe four millimeters of uh, bone for the sinus lift to turn a uh, locator case into a very successful uh, hybrid case. And one nice thing about the 3D view uh, with this, uh, software with any of the softwares in the 3D view is that we can turn it over and you can actually see your implants in the sinus and get an idea of where where you can put bone how much you need to put in uh, any of that so it's a very good visual of of what uh, what needs done okay All right. Now we do, uh, you know, one thing I'll just mention that I really didn't plan on mentioning, but we make bone supported guides now with Blue Sky Bio, and, and we have been having uh, extreme success with those uh, cases as far as accuracy uh, of placement goes. And, uh, you know, especially when you are doing uh, cases where you, you don't have a lot of you know, bone width around the implant, and you have to thread the needle uh, on edentulous cases. A bone that, or a guide that sits directly on bone, is uh, you know very uh, 
a very beneficial uh, thing that uh, is you know very helpful for accuracy and and one nice thing about it is that when you get the guide from us uh, the bone guide we make a bone model the guide sits on top of that you can actually do a pre-surgery on on the bone model to be happy that uh, you know you're you're satisfied you're not going to get any perforations or dehiscences uh, uh, you, you know, to make make yourself feel good that you're going to be accurate. So that's uh, that's just another added benefit that we we have with Blue Sky too. So uh, that is the end of the uh, lecture webinar. I've enjoyed having it. If there's any other last questions here that I can entertain, I'm always happy to do that. Anything else come in, Mike? Um, I just want to mention a few recent updates regarding the Blue Sky Plan software. We have a build on our website that includes, first of all, includes an intelligent automatic panoramic curve. So when you load your case, the curve's drawn for you. If you have both a mandible and maxilla in the case, then it will draw both curves for you and you could toggle between them. We also just released an automatic nerve detection, which means you could mark one point on the entrance of the mental nerve and the software will automatically draw, draw the nerve for you as well. In addition, the software now has different viewing modes, different using modes. It has a view, uh, viewing mode, a normal, and an advanced to uh, address different types of users. The viewing mode is extremely simple. It has the functionality just for viewing and uh, reviewing cases. Um, very quick and easy to learn. Normal modes, normal and advanced is for more advanced functionality and uh, digitally designing surgical guides. Mm -hmm. So we highly recommend downloading the latest version of the software and uh, getting updated with uh, that. Um, please make sure to enter your details into the webinar attendance form so we could send the CE credit. The CE credit is sent via email and usually arrives within uh, one week of the webinar presentation. The link for the attendance forms could be seen under the video, the video windows that you're looking at now, and was also sent earlier today via email. Um, Joe, do you want to put up your contact information? I do. One thing I'll say too. Let me say this, Michael. Uh, we at Road Dental Lab have been working with Blue Sky for a lot of years now, and uh, I I have to honestly say, and this is from my heart, there's nothing that I'm paid to say or anything like that is that they are probably the most responsive uh, implant uh, company that we work with. Uh, we we get direct answers. We get them very quickly. If there's anything that uh, they can do to make life better uh, with their software, they certainly are trying to do it and have done a lot of good things with it since we started using it. So. Uh, you know, as well as their implant systems too. Uh, the people that I talk to that use it are very happy with it. Uh, no issues uh, as far as quality of product or that sort of thing or prosthetic parts. So, I just want to compliment Blue Sky on uh, your efforts in in you know in the software and with your implants, Mike. Great, thank you very much. And like I mentioned at the onset of the presentation, if, any, if you have guided surgical cases. Rose is a great place to have them done. They'll take good care of you. Fantastic results as well. Uh, you can see on this screen Joe's contact information. Uh, if you have any questions, address the Blue Sky bio or to me. You could contact us via our website or email to plan at blueskybio.com. Uh, I think that uh, pretty much wraps things up for tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And uh, Joe, I'd like to thank you for the presentation as always. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure, and uh, I hope everybody has a good evening. And let me say this, too, before I hang up. We're in Ohio, so uh, if you're a football fan, root for the Buckeyes tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs>